Dink, say goodbye to Felix. Hmm? Uh, man talk. Huh. I'm getting out when I'm ready, and that's never in daylight. This time you are in fast. Where's your boat? Fetch my shoes. You don't like me, Bond. You don't like my methods. You think I'm an accountant. A bean counter more interested in my numbers than your instincts. The thought had occurred to me. Good. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. Whose boyish charms, though wasted on me, obviously appeal to that young woman I sent out to evaluate you. Point taken. Not quite, 007. Hello everyone, welcome to Visual Literacy Hub, this is Angela. I created this channel to record my daily observation and analysis about this very visual world that we live in. My analysis is 100% personal, nothing professional. It is about you and I together to see, think and share. Well, let the fun begin! One of the controversial elements of Bond movies is its long history of objectifying women. For decades, Bond sent a message to his viewers that misogyny is not a big deal as long as he's handsome, violent and rich enough. He was a man who enjoys treating women like pets and toys, sometimes even abusively. One of Bond's greatest interests was to indoctrinate girls from enemies so that they fall in line with his side. In Goldfinger, Bond even forced himself upon a girl who doesn't share the same sexuality. Of course, this is a reflection of its time and what was accepted by the society back then. But there were also independent female characters who were portrayed as charming, sometimes even stronger and better than Bond. 1985, Thunderball was the last Bond film for the 57-year-old Roger Moore. The character Mayday contrasted Bond's aging body with her dark, beautiful skin, her tall and powerful body and moves. Unlike many other movies where Bond neutralized the enemy by making them fall in love with him, Mayday chose to help him because he saw through the ruthlessness of her boss, Zorin. In 1999's Tomorrow Never Dies, Michonne Yeon played a Chinese agent who worked with Bond side by side to stop the war instigated by the bad guy. She broke the uncharacteristic and low status of female Asian stars in Western movies. She was not portrayed as an eye candy, but a self-conscious woman who is as brave, as wise, and as tough as Bond. She doesn't wear deep V-dresses or delicate makeup to attract Bond or her audience. Her charm lies in her resilience, courage, and strength. As mentioned in the previous episode, the old James Bond, the hard-nosed British man who is irresistible to women, has been slowly phased out under Daniel Craig's Bond, who opened a new era where Bond can be vulnerable, emotional, and loyal to his love of life. The woman that appeared in the latest movie No Time to Die also reflects the shifting expectation of female characters in spy or action movies. Paloma, played by Cuban actress Anna de Armas, is a rookie CIA agent who only received three weeks of training. She easily wins the audience heart by her wit, spinning kicks, and the incredible beauty and power. Lashana Lynch, a London-born actress of Jamaican descent, plays the role of the new 007 in this movie. Her sharpness and professionality earn immediate respect from both Bond and her audience. In recent years, there is more collaboration than unilateral conquest between Bond and the female characters. These female characters are no longer just Bond's girl waiting to be saved or neutralized. They have their unique characters, skills, and they are as powerful, strong, and admirable, often even more than James Bond himself. They do not necessarily all have to fall in love with Bond, and their world is not centered around Bond anymore. Most of the time, they just do their things and they don't care, and I love that. There has been a lot of talk about whether or not the Bond series is relevant now because of who he is and the way he treats women. Kim Sherwood, the first female 007 author, said that he is absolutely relevant now. It just got to grow. It just got to evolve. And the important thing is that the film treats women properly. He doesn't have to. He needs to be true to this character. Yes, my name is Bond. James Bond. I am looking for Dr. Goodhead. You just found her. A woman. Your powers of observation do you credit, Mr. Bond? 
James. Indeed, the original setting of Bond makes him a chauvinist, a bastard who happens to be handsome and charming. If this figure is ditched completely and James Bond becomes Captain UK, there is no point in continuing the series. Because Bond is a very flawed character from the start, and he can never be perfect or 100% correct. He is self-centered, arrogant, ruthless most of the time, but he also saves the world and helps people, which balances out a little bit of his negative characteristics. Having strong and independent woman characters like M, who clearly points out his problems, allowed the movie to show its awareness, makes the movie more acceptable in the current context, while allowing Bond to continue to be true to his original setting. At the end of the day, if all bad guys become Captain America, I see that as the end of movie industry. The method of acknowledging his flaw, however, does not work that well in the context of racism. We can have as many great actors and actresses from all over the world as we want to contrast with Bond's slightly racist nature, but that doesn't mean that it's still okay for Bond to continue saying inappropriate things, because while being a chauvinist is viewed as a flaw and is despised, and you may be able to get away with it by acknowledging that as a flaw of the character, being a racist is a big no-no in any movie or media industry. There was some ugly racial discrimination in early Bond movies. Vijay will take you from here. I'll stay and see if I can find out anything more about the map. Good. Hold on to this, will you? Keep you in Kari for a few weeks, will it? Thank you. It's a wonderful friend. Even when the movie seems to try to appreciate a foreign culture, it still feels wrong and awkward. You don't become Japanese by simply putting on a wig and some fake eyelid, or wearing a kimono. Similarly, even in the latest movie No Time to Die, the villain decorated his home base like a Japanese Zen garden, and doing the opposite things of what could happen in a real Zen garden. In the discussion of who the next Bond will be, despite his flat denial, there is persistent speculation that Idris Elba will become the next Bond, and this actor is ranked on the top 5 favourites to take up the role. 007 producer Barbara Broccoli also stated in 2019 that she felt it was time for an ethnic minority actor to fill the 007 role, and was certain that it will happen eventually. All these signals are telling us a time of true diversity seems to be slowly on its way. But when her casting was revealed in 2019, Lynch was subjected to abuse from trolls, who argued that 007 should only be played by a white man. This reveals that there is a long way ahead of us still. Any topic related to race is a complicated one. The debate between colorblind casting and color conscious casting is the battle between casting based on performance, not color, and respecting the original setting. On one hand, we had Noma Dumaswini played Hermione Granger in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, which as an audience, I felt her performance was perfect. We had Will Smith play the supervillain Deadshot, a character traditionally portrayed as half Hispanic. We had Lucy Liu's marvelous and successful performance of Watson, which is not only colorblind casting, but also gender blind. In a long history of movie industry, Non-white actors and actresses could only play certain instrumental roles in the service of white characters. Colorblind casting allows us to shine a spotlight on these actors and actresses and their talent. On the other hand, classic movie characters like James Bond have been the embodiment of a country's culture and values. Plus, color conscious means that people are aware of the historic discrimination in the entertainment industry and avoid color washing. Would Chinese feel comfortable if Mulan is performed by a white girl? Would Indians feel comfortable seeing Jasmine being performed by a black lady? Can an Asian lady cast Moana? See, it's tricky. Personally, I think the core problem is that we don't have enough good stories of non-white origin in mainstream movie industry. We need more black stories, Asian stories, Hispanic stories. We need more female heroes, we need less stereotypical villains played by the Russians and Middle East people. We need to change it from the origin, that is to allow more stories from different backgrounds to be seen and celebrated. 
And by then, maybe color conscious or color blind is no longer a debate because there are enough opportunities for everyone. When compared with all other protagonists in spy and action movies, the most distinguished elements of James Bond has to be his suits. But why do we love to see James Bond fighting in his expensive suits? In fact, the image of a fighter in a suit can be traced back to 19th century England. The rapid development of the society resulted in serious social tensions and high crime rate. Thugs roam in the groups, robbing people, often targeting well-dressed gentlemen. In order to defend himself, Edward William Barton Wright integrated the jiu-jitsu that he had learned in Japan with other martial arts to create a method of self-defense, which he named Bartitsu, a word combining his last name Barton and jiu-jitsu. It incorporates a variety of low kicks, use of walking stick and joint locking skills that, when performed effectively, can end the fight quickly. It offered well-dressed British men a practical yet dignified option for self-defense, and therefore soon became popular. Bartitsu highlights the spirit of chivalry through its ability to handle chaos while allowing elegance and manner. Oh, another aspect. Suits also symbolize restraints and abstinence. When juxtapositioned with violence, rage, and death, it forms a special aesthetic quality that is visible in many movies like Kinsman, John Wick, and The Transporter. The same visual aesthetic occurs when Anna kills enemies in her stunning formal dress. The combination of elegance and violence never goes out of style. That's all I want to share with you in this episode. Thank you for watching. There's just too much worthy investigating in James Bond movies that two episodes are just not enough to introduce them all. Maybe when the next James Bond movie comes out, we can repick this topic and continue to explore the visuals and aesthetics of the 007 series. Which actor or actress do you think could be the next James Bond? Leave me a comment below. Like this video and subscribe if you find it interesting or it inspires some critical thinking in you. See you next Wednesday. Bye!